Here's an interesting fact for you. Did you know that during the 1970s, MG didn't launch a single new model? They did bring out the MG BV8, but that's a sort of derivative of a car they were already producing. And the reason for that is because during that 10 year period, they were part of British Leyland and the top brass there didn't see MG as being sort of like their sporting flagship. They thought Triumph was the mark that they were going to promote as their sporting brand. And in 1980, this last MG, the only one that was in production, the by then archaic MG, rolled off the production line and that was to be the end of the brand. Now that's really, really sad if you think about it, because if you think back to sort of like classic cars in our mind, we have this image of these sort of like little red sports cars running around quaint little English villages driven by RAF types, you know, called Digby or Rupert or Spread Eagle. And that's kind of where MG was. They had such an illustrious history as producing sports cars, you know, sort of like from the early 1920s all the way up to the 19, well, the 1980s. But then something odd happened during the 1980s. Two years after the demise of MG in 1980, 1982, the famed Octagon reappeared on the front of a Metro. And therefore, what then happened was MG became the maker of hot hatchbacks. Now, MG's history since the 1980s is, shall we say, pockmarked. And of course, the whole collapse of the brand, only for it to be bought then by the Chinese, will go down in motoring folklore. But they were reintroduced back into the UK and they became known as sort of like producing good value for money, small hatchbacks and SUVs with a, a leaning towards electrification. But MG has such an illustrious history. They don't want to be seen just the maker of value for money cars. They want to trade on that sporting history. Now they're going to return to the sports car market soon with the new Cyberstar. And now they're returning to their other market they're very famous for, the hot hatch market with this, the new MG4 x -Power. So, welcome to this week's road test review back in Scotland. Welcome to the new MG4 x -Power. And as always, welcome to Auto EV. Now, before we get started on this week's road test review of the new MG4 x -Power, it is of course that time when I'm gonna ask you to make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. Then once you've done that, make sure you press the little bell button that's also down there because then that way you'll be notified when the next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you watch the video, if you do enjoy it, make sure you give it a thumbs up and of course, let me know your thoughts down below in the comment section. Let me know what your thoughts are on the cars that we review, such as the MG4 x -Power, and of course, on the Auto EV channel as a whole. So MG, like I said, when they came back to the UK, um, they came back as sort of a, a, a manufacturer of sort of like good value for money, small hatchbacks and SUVs with a, a leaning towards electrification. But they've got such an illustrious history in terms of sort of sporting history that they don't want to just be seen as the makers of just budget sort of like cars. Now, they're going to return to the sports car market, like I said. We've already seen the new MG Cyberstar we saw it at Goodwood. And of course, the other car they showed it public for the first time at Goodwood Festival of Speed was this, the MG4 x -Power. Their entrant into the hot hatch market and also their entrant into an electric hot hatch market, which we're starting to see a lot of manufacturers get involved in. Now, when they launched the MG4 last year, it is fair to say we were quite taken with the car. It's a great, great car. And of course, it's great in terms of what it's designed to do, a five-door family hatchback with an electric drivetrain. But does that translate into a great hot hatch? But before we move on, let's remind ourselves what the MG4 is all about. Well, it was the brand's first ground-up EV sitting on the company's new scalable EV platform. It's a five-door hatchback that competes in the C-sector marketplace, and that in itself accounts for 40% of the UK market. It's the first MG4 to offer dual motors delivering a power output of 435 PS, making it the most powerful production series MG ever made. It has a 64 kilowatt hour battery, allowing a WLTP range of up to 239 miles. And it's priced in the UK from just over £36,000, which includes MG's industry-leading seven-year warranty. Now, putting 435 PS into an all-wheel drive small hatchback gives the new MG4 x supercar-destroying performance. But as we've said time and time again on Auto EV, it's very easy to make an EV fast, but can you make it fun? And if MG are going to go back into the hot hatch market, it has to be fun. 
So what was left to do? But of course, bring it back to my favourite road, the Beef Tub, up in Scotland, to put it through the road test that actual car buyers trust when it comes to choosing their next electric vehicle. And that is the Auto EV one. Now let's start with styling, because immediately we run into a little bit of a problem in the fact that it looks exactly like every other MG4. Now that's not a bad thing, because I happen to think the MG4 is a great looking car. In fact, I think it's MG's best looking car. I love these sort of like, lovely sharp sort of like LED headlamps they've got here. I love the big bold MG octagon there. I love this kind of jutting chin spoiler with the active cooling that's down at the bottom. And I love this new matte racing green paint that they finished it in. So yeah, it's a good looking car, but it looks like a regular MG4. Now, are they going for that Q car look? I'm not sure. I think a hot hatch should look like a hot hatch. It should be like a, it should be like a, a rampant toddler dressed head to toe in 1980s Benetton because it should look fun. And I'm not sure this looks fun. Round the side, well again, it's an MG4. And as I say, that's not a bad thing because I think it's a great looking car. I love this sharp line that kind of spears through the door. I love this other one here that comes out the back window there and just goes into the rear lights to wrap round. Now on the X-Power, you get these new 18 inch five spoke wheels. And of course you get these orange X-Power calipers, except they're not actually calipers. They're just covers that go over the regular calipers. Hmm, Never mind. Now you get this different graphic at the bottom here, you see it's got this kind of graphite inlay just like it did at the front as well. It's nice big bold mirrors there with the, the cameras in the side there and of course your nice big chunky door handles too. So as you say, it's a good looking car, there's no doubt about it. It just looks like a normal regular MG4 really, with a set of covers over the calipers and oh and a different set of alloy wheels. And around the back it's exactly the same, you get that nice sweeping light bar across that you do in the regular trophy model that you don't get in the SE. Uh, you kind of bold octagon inlaid into that perspex there. Twin roof spoilers again to aid with aerodynamics. Now, a couple of changes they've made to the cars as well. Look, since I first road tested it, put a rear wiper on the car. So that's a good one. Thank you, MG. As I say, it cures that because there is a vortex, as I say, as this as water comes down here, it does create a bit of a vortex. So thanks for putting that on MG, I do appreciate that. There's another change which I'll show you about in a second inside the car that they've done, which a lot of people commented on in our original road test. So that's interesting to discuss. But yeah, like I say, you've got this kind of upswept kind of diffuser. That was there in the standard car. And you're going to get this nice light graphic that you'll see at night, you know, across the back of the car along the top as well, which is lovely. But again, it's not really any different to the regular MG Trophy, uh, the MG4 Trophy. So. My problem isn't with how this car looks, it's with how this car doesn't look, if that makes sense. It's a bit like Mini with the electric. They badge it as a Cooper S, but style it to look like a normal Mini. And we know that to drive, it's a brilliant car. It should look a little bit more brilliant. Or should it? Or am I being a bit silly about this? What do you think? Is it understated performance that you would buy the car for? Or do you agree with me? Should it look a little bit more like a sort of like a fun hot hatch with sort of like you know bigger spoilers? Maybe a little bit more like that EX4 concept that we saw at the Goodwood Festival of Speed that looked like that it was that tribute to the Metro 6R4. Should they have styled it a little bit more like that with some extra spoilers and scuts and extended wheel arches and things? What do you think? As always, let me know down in the comments. Now obviously boot space is the same as we've um, seen before in the regular MG before we tested last year and it's 363 litres, so not the biggest in its class, it does trail the Volkswagen ID3 and obviously the Cooper Born, but it is bigger than say the little Aura Funky Cat, um, the other sort of like C-sector Chinese uh, five-door hatchback that's come to the marketplace. Um, Yes, you can extend it by flipping down the standard 6040 rear seats. Now that takes it up to 1,177 litres. But, oddly enough, for sitting on a bespoke platform, there's no underfloor cable storage. Now, it is a rear wheel drive, well, this is the dual motor car, obviously, but the, the motor in the regular car sits underneath here. So that's probably why. So your cables have to come in the two bags. So that's the, sort of like the only real kind of downside to it, in fairness. But it is a nice square shape. There's no big wheel arch intrusions. Nice rigid parcel shelf. You've got a couple of little pockets at the side there and some little hooks up at, up at the top there to hang bags from. But other than that, that's it. But I'm not sure you'd expect much more for a five-door C-sector family hatch, would you? 
which also means the rear seat space hasn't changed. Which again is fine because it was okay actually in fairness. It was alright when I road tested it last year. It's what you'd expect for this sort of like, you know, sort of like segment of car. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of tightness underneath um, the driver's seat for my feet. Obviously the driver's seat set up for myself. And I'm five foot seven, maybe five foot eight. Who knows? Answers in the postcard, please. Um, I do like the seat quite low in fairness, so that's probably accounting for some of that tightness. So if you're a, a driver who has the seat up a little bit, you should be all right in fairness in the back here. Um, yeah, as I say, it's absolutely fine. There's plenty of headroom. No sunroof in the car. Don't let the black roof fool you. It's just a dual tone paintwork. But it does, like the roof does kind of scoop up here. So it feels like it should have one, if that makes sense. Um, you do feel a little bit enclosed, however. It's quite a dark interior of the car. So you do feel a little bit more enclosed. But in terms of its actual space, it's fine. Now, as I say, it's a dedicated EV platform. MG's uh, first, the scalable one. There's a tiny little bit of a raised centre section there but not enough that's going to cause any discomfort to a middle passenger here. And of course, you can get a middle passenger in here um, because on the 77 kilowatt uh, ID4 from, sorry, ID3 from Volkswagen, you can. Um, one USB-A socket there, and there's a little storage tray just at the back of what would be the front console. Um, there's map pockets here, and you get these little pockets in there as well to store your polaments and things like that. Now, this is the other bit that they've changed for this one. Centre rear head restraint. Now, they didn't have that on the original MG4 trophy that we road tested last year. And I must admit, I didn't really pick up on it. I just thought, well, it's not there. There was a lot of people in the comments that were saying that's a real omission, because obviously you want, you know, someone that's in the centre to have a head restraint. And of course, now they have. So thank you, MG. It sounds like you've been listening to people. There's no fold-down armrest, though. So you don't have a fold-down armrest you know, with cup holders and such like as that. And the door bins, they're not really going to take much, in fairness. They may take a smaller child's water bottle. They certainly won't take my slightly larger one. So just be aware of that. The other thing in terms of children, there is Isofix points, um, but they're behind these kind of <laughs> Velcro flaps. So, yeah, not quite as neat a solution, maybe as the little plastic covers. But it has them, so that's good. So... On the whole, what I'm trying to say in terms of practicality, you're not losing really anything um, with the X Power over the standard MG4, which in itself is a good car in terms of rear seat accommodation. They've made the little changes, like I said, like the addition of the rear wiper and now that centre rear head restraint. But it would be nice to see maybe other things such as, you know, a fold down armrest with cup holders in it, maybe an extra USB port in there. So maybe for the facelift MG, we could see things like that. Otherwise, it's pretty much as you'd expect for this style of car. Okay, so the inside. Well, again, it hasn't really changed. And this is where I'm starting to have a little bit of an issue. Not, not a massive problem. I'm just a bit disappointed. Now, first things first. MG, where's the red seat belt, please? Yeah? I loved MG having red seat belts back in the 80s. That would have been nice to have. Um, so the only difference really to the inside of the X-Power, to the, uh, the Trophy, um, is what you get is you get red stitch, same seats, which are, you know, they're nice enough. I'll go on to the seats in a second, but instead of the material in the middle, you get this, like a, a kind of fake Alcantara and you get the red stitching around it. That's it. That's the only real difference in here. There isn't even red stitching on the steering wheel, which would have been nice, or a red octagon badge. Just something just to lift it, to make you think you're sitting in the X power. You've, you know, you've got that power underneath you. That'd have been nice. Anyway, so let's have a quick recap on the interior of the MG4 because th there's, there's, you know, I've spent a bit of time with this car because obviously I've come up to Scotland in it. Um, and whilst when I had the trophy last year, I did lots of little kind of shorter journeys. I think I did one big kind of reasonable long journey. I've been in this car a lot and done a lot of miles in it. Um, so I've started to sort of like really find, get into sort of the nooks and crannies with it. So the first thing about it is, as I say, the styling of the interior is the same as we've seen before. And I quite like the style of the interior of the car. It's not the best interior out there, but it certainly isn't the worst. So it's a bit like um, the ID3, um, the BMW i3, um, the Cooper Bond thing. You get basically two separate screens rather than kind of one integrated you know sort of you know screens that are all integrated into one um you get this little seven and a half inch 
uh, uh, sorry, seven-inch screen behind the uh, steering wheel. Uh, it's squared off, and like the ID3, you do get all the sort of information that you get. Uh, sorry, you need in here, uh, and there is quite a bit of information, but they've managed to get it all in, and I think it does work quite well. So you get your central speedo, you get your trip meter, or depending obviously what you want to actually see on the side there, whether you want the navigation. Uh, you can adjust certain things like you know the brightness of it. You can have your media displayed in there, uh, tire pressure warning system, and um, back to trip meter. So you can change that a little bit as you, what you want. Like Tesla MG with the cameras, when you're driving along, you it starts to pick up the other cars that are sort of like surrounding you. So that's quite nice. You get a nice if there's a car in your kind of blind spot over there, it will tell you there. And then you get things like your state of charge, uh, your range to go, and then your brake. Uh, read out there for your brake regen down there. So there's enough information on it. It's crisp, it's clear, it's relatively easy to read, and as I say, there's all the information that you need on it. So no issue with that at all. This screen here, so this is the 10 and a quarter inch infotainment screen. Right, couple of things with this now. This is much better than it was um, when, when, the first, when MG first came back with the ZS electric, their SUV. Uh, and the first MG5, we did say that the infotainment system wasn't that good. They then updated it on the facelifted MG ZS and then obviously the new MG5, and then this has now moved on to the MG4. And it's okay, but what I will say is this, it has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto wired. It's not wireless Apple CarPlay. And a few times on the way up here, it, it doesn't respond, look, it doesn't respond to the first press. You've got to, see? That's my issue. And when you're driving along the motorway and you've got to keep, oh God, you've got to keep pressing it. It's a bit clunky. It needs to be slicker. i tell you what it's like. It's like when you were a kid and your mum and dad said, you want for Christmas? You say, oh, a stereo system, you know, a new hi-fi system. And you prayed to God they bought you like your mates had, like a Sony or a Kenwood. And what they got you was actually the Matsui, the shop's own brand. It still was a stereo and it still had, you know, a tape player and a CD player and a radio, but it just was all about cheap feeling and clunky and stuff like that that's what it's like it's like an own brand stereo it needs to be slicker with you know the 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 the, 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 the changes that volkswagen have made to their infotainment system well not well still not brilliant it is better than this i just find this a bit too clunky it's miles behind the likes of hyundai and kia in terms of what this does um you know i mean all, all the functionality is there but the operating of it is just very, very clunky. And I have to say, I've had real... In fact, Apple CarPlay would not work at all yesterday. I had to shut the car down, wait a few minutes, start it back up to get it to work again. So that needs changing, in, in, in my opinion. That's that's a, a focus for it. Right, OK, well, I won't keep going on about stuff like that. Um, it's obviously got an inbuilt navigation system. Um, if you want it, it's all right. Uh, as I say, I tend to use Apple CarPlay anyway, um, and that's fine. Um, you've got physical buttons down here. Um, now, there, you've got volume control there, a home button, uh, hazards, heated rear screen, maximum defrost, and then your uh, climate control. Now, I've got a bit of an apology to make here because on the, the original road test, I said, oh, it's a shame you've got to delve into the screen to get your, um, to get your climate control to work. People commented on this and I've now found out what you can do. You can assign it to one of the favourite buttons on the steering wheel. So this one on the right here, if I press that, it gives me my climate menu. And now I use the joystick to either adjust the fan speed or the temperature and by going up and down. I didn't realise that was there and I apologise and thank you to everyone who commented that you could do that. That's good. I like that. The fact you can just assign it to that favourite button. And this favourite button here I've now assigned to the driving modes. So again, I don't need to go into the screen to change the driving modes. So you can set it up um, to be uh, at a fingertip away. So kudos. I didn't realise. I apologise. I've realised it now and I like that. That's good. Let me talk about the steering wheel while I'm here. Um, I still not, I'm still not convinced. I get the shape, so you can see the screen, this kind of quartic shape, and I like the two-spoke design. I, I've just found it a bit uncomfortable. It's still just a bit. I don't know. It's okay in terms of its its um, its girth, but I just don't find it the most comfortable wheel to hold over a long journey. As I say, I've you know I've driven up to Scotland with the car. It's all right, but. 
it could be better, is my, my viewpoint. Um, still, it adjusts for reach and rake, um, which is good, although the screen's attached to the, sorry, attached to the dashboard. So unlike the ID3, that doesn't move. It stays attached to the dashboard. The buttons on the steering wheel are really nice to use. Um, they are physical. You've physically got to touch them. Um, you know, the, 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 the way the joysticks move, um, the fact you can assign those favourites, um, the cruise control um, button that's there that's nice and easy to use, the telephone, the menu buttons. Yeah, great. I do like that. And as I say, you can just you can adjust volume um, on that side there and then you can up and down your cruise control with that one on that side there. So I can't complain about its functionality. I just don't particularly like the actual steering wheel. Column stocks, yeah, they're behind and they've got a nice kind of, they've got a nice feel to them. I like that. Uh, mirror switch is down by your right knee, along with your headlamp levelling adjust. No head-up display, but then there's an argument that says you probably don't need it with that clear screen right in front of you. Centre console, wireless charging pad. As I say, you still have to use a wire if you want to use Apple. I've got the longest wire in the world here. Um, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so that's there. Uh, this little sort of like ledge that comes out with the gear selection indicator, sorry, the gear, <laughs> um, the gear uh, stick, if you like, sorry, the rotary, I've lost my words now, the gear selector and the electronic part brake, I like that, it's like the Audi Q4 e-tron, it just kind of juts out like that, and as you see, your wireless charging pad is there. There's excellent storage in the car. So I've got my usual water bottle, coffee flask, they go down into there. And then you've got this lovely sort of like big um, storage bin down here. Nice so sunglasses. My wallet fits in there. There's a little neck pocket just behind that for putting things in. And we've also got a great big cubby bin in there for putting your polaments in and stuff. Door bins, again, they're good. They'll, they're, they're better in the front than they are on the back. They'll fit an additional water bottle um, as well. And you've got sunglasses hold up there. Right, the only thing is... Apart from the styling of it, I think should be different. Um, the plastics are now starting to feel a little bit cheap. As I say, now, don't don't get me wrong, it's well built. There's not a creak, not a rattle, not a squeak from this car. You know, so that's all fine. And the top of the dashboard there, that kind of rubberized kind of material is quite nice. And I don't have an issue with sort of the way it is. But there's just some of the plastics, they do feel quite cheap and as i say if, if mg are wanting to kind of alleviate the perception of the brand that's the next thing they have to concentrate on is the kind of plastics dare i suggest it's well built as i say there's no denying that nothing moves nothing creaks nothing you know it's all fine my only caveat to that is this center armrest doesn't have a catch on it even a couple of little magnets just to keep that because that'll end up just wearing out i think but as i say they need to just lift the interior um, in terms of the materials that they're using. A lot of people are doing it, a lot of people can do it. As I say, if you look at where Kia and Hyundai were 10 years ago, even to where they are now, it, it's night and day difference. So I'm sure MG will get there, but they do need to concentrate on that. And as I say, this, um, this, this screen's not great. As I say, it's just, there's just too many times it hasn't been responsive enough and I've got to keep pressing it press hard and when you're driving up the motorway at you know sort of like 70 miles an hour it's not what you want to be doing right seats the seats are good as i say they're the same as you find in the standard car so they've got the kind of wrap round shoulder bit there this center section rather than a cloth material is this kind of fake alcantara and that's also on the doors as well so that's quite nice but again i'd just like to have seen a little bit more effort put into this being the x power there's electric adjustment on the driver's side but not on the passenger um, and whilst you have height adjustment you don't have tilt so the driving position's good and i you know as i say i was in the car for what eight hours uh driving up to scotland and i got out fine i wasn't achy or anything like that so the seats do hold you well but I just feel there should be a little bit more. It'd be nice to be able to tilt the seat, I from, certainly for me. I like kind of having, the, you know, my legs up a little bit more. And as I say, just feeling a bit more kind of hunkered into the car. Nine out of ten people aren't going to have a problem with this, in fairness. But again, I just feel that there's, you know, it's the X power. It's the, you know, the the the, the range topper. There should be a little bit more, I think. Other than that, as I say, it's familiar MG4 that we've been used to, which. As I say, I don't have a problem with in that sense. I have a problem what they haven't done with it 
that's where I have the issue. Now the XPR gets the 64 kilowatt hour battery from the Trophy model and that should give a WLTP range of up to 239 miles. Now, in my experience with the car, um, I've had it, and as I say, okay, a lot of it's, most of it's been really kind of motorway work and higher speed work. Um, I've been getting round about the 200 mark, in fairness. You will get more if you're a bit careful with the car. Obviously, you'll get less if you're not so careful with it. So, again, it's probably, it's not far off what sort of like MG say they're doing. At the moment, I'm getting, since my last charge, it's showing 2.3 miles per kilowatt. Uh, kilowatt hour so not great if you times that by a 64 kilowatt hour battery but as I say you can attribute that maybe to the way it's been driven anyway um, charging speeds uh, 150 kilowatts so you'll go from your benchmark 10 to 80 percent in 35 minutes so again par for the course and if you're charging up uh, from 10% to 100% on your 7 kilowatt wall boxes, they say it'll take you around about 9 hours. Now, interestingly, um, for the same price as this car, MG have now launched an extended range battery, a 77 kilowatt hour battery, which they say should give speed, uh, sorry, uh, range in excess of 300 miles. And it's more powerful than the standard trophy model, though not quite the power of this car. So that's an interesting alternative, shall we say, if you're after range rather than performance. Now, obviously, X-Power. Uh, it's a name that MG used in the past, um, when it was part of the, when the Phoenix 4 had it, when it was, uh, you know, part of BMW. And they were going to be doing, uh, sorry, after BMW debacle, and they were going to be doing the ridiculous supercar, the SV thing, and, and, and they were going to do a, a high-powered version of the V8 ZT, and they went under the banner of X-Power. So they've revived that name. And as you can imagine, they've revived it because it's all about power. 430 brake horsepower going through two motors in this five-door family hatchback. Now, frankly, that's ludicrous. Um, it is searingly fast, this car, uh, in terms of acceleration. Not to 60 in this car, in this little five-door family hatchback, is 3.8 seconds. Now, an Audi e-tron GT, not an e-tron, not the big SUV, an e-tron GT does it in 4.1. It's absolutely nuts. It really is absolutely nuts. But it's a lot of fun, obviously, if your idea of fun is straight line velocity. If jumping away from traffic lights is your thing, then this does it very, very well. In fact, let me just show you what it feels like. So what we need to do is we need to get the car into sport mode. Uh, we come to a stop, foot on the brake, hard down the accelerator. We feel a little nudge from the, the car and then and there we go. It's just crazy speed. I mean, I'm not sure that's needed. Okay, away from that, let's discuss whether or not the MG4 X Power is actually any fun or not. Hmm. Now, they've done a lot to the car, in fairness, over the standard MG4. It's not just bolting on. So it's two motors. So the standard one that's always at the back, there's now one at the front um, to add on to that ridiculous power. And then... What they've also done is they've played with the the electronics in the chassis. So there's now um, a dynamic dynamic cornering control system, um, which works alongside the electronic differential, and also an intelligent motor control. And the whole system is designed to deal with torque vectoring. So in other words, distributing the power to what wheel needs it. And going all-wheel drive in the car has kind of robbed the MG4's delicacy a little bit. Whereas the standard trophy, which is rear-wheel drive, and not slouch, you know, it's still over 200 horsepower, so it's still a, a relatively quick car, it just feels a little bit more delicate in its chassis. What this is, as I say, is very, very fast. What it's not is particularly fun. They say they've tweaked the steering as well, but I can't really feel it, if I'm honest. It just feels standard fare MG4 to me, which is good. As I say, I just don't think it's 
giving me the feedback that I want if I wanted a fun hot hatchback. They've, they've stiffened the spring and damper rates by 25%. Now, whilst it has a relatively decent control, what it doesn't seem to have is a delicacy, as I say, to it. It, it, it. it just feels, you can feel it all working underneath you, but not in a good way, not in a, a way that makes you want to sort of like get involved with it. You know, you turn it into a bend and you apply some lock and you apply some throttle and you can feel the power shift. In the standard MG4 Trophy, the rear wheel drive car, what would then happen is the, the, the rear end would dig in and it would just tighten its line as the front wheel started to grip. What happens here is you can feel the power move to the front because obviously what it's doing is it's sitting down at the back so therefore the front wheels are coming up a little bit and it's maybe detecting it's losing a bit of traction. It throws the power to the front and halfway through a bend you start to feel the understeer. It kind of washes out a little bit. It doesn't have that really kind of nice little bit where it just kind of you know, as I say, it kind of digs into the, it digs into the sort of like, you know, the corner, it hooks you in and just sort of like, you know, tweaks you around, which is what I really like about sort of like the standard MG4. You don't get it here, which is a little bit of a shame. I'd almost prefer it if they'd stuck with a single rear drive motor, dialed the power back to sort of like 300 horsepower and kept the sort of the, the fluency in the chassis and kept that really nice because I think that would have been where the, this car should really have been pitched. I think this whole kind of Tesla baiting 400 horsepower ridiculous not to 60 time is all very well and good. It doesn't make up for what it's then detracted from in terms of the chassis balance. That's my issue. And it is a real shame, I think. Now, there is another new MG4 out, as I said, the extended range, there's an extended range car, which gets a bigger battery over the long range car, confusing, I know. It gets a 77 kilowatt hour battery, and it gives, well, 300 miles, they say, or just over 300 miles is WLTP, um, but it also gets more power, 250 horsepower, and that brings the not to 60 time down to about 6 seconds. In fact, I reckon you'd probably get a smidge under that. So five point something seconds, and I think that, because it retains the single motor, it retains the rear wheel drive chassis, I think that might be the sweet spot in this range. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing intrinsically wrong here, and as I say, if your idea of fun is just sheer acceleration, then I can understand why you might think that this is a fun car. But if what you want is handling and a delicacy of a chassis, I'm afraid you're going to be a bit disappointed, I think. Now, let's just discuss a few other things about this car before we move on. Um, ride quality. Well, as I say, they've brought the, the they've, they've stiffened up spring and dampers 25%. Um, mm, yeah, and you can kind of feel it on these slightly rougher roads. And it's not a particularly well controlled, it's all right, it's okay, as I say, but it's when you sort of like up the speed, you start to realise that it stays quite flat through the corners, and that's a little bit of the problem. It just, you can feel then it gets a bit top heavy, almost kind of, I don't know, you can feel everything shifting around, and it just, it's very difficult then to sort of like string a lot of nice kind of bends together. See, look there, it's just, just gets a bit out of shape, you know, when it's sort of like it meets something that's just, you know, just a bit too much for it to answer. And that's what I mean, you, you get lulled into this high performance, this speed, and then the chassis doesn't really cope with it. It's very Tesla-like, and I mean that in a, in, in, with a huge amount of respect, um, because as I say, I really do like the MG4, I think it's a great car, but it is very Tesla-like, it's all about the speed not so much about the handling and the control and I think that's a shame. Um, brakes, okay the brakes, they've increased the size of the brakes, uh, I think they're 350 mil, uh, 354 mil uh, discs all round, yeah okay there's a relatively nice kind of pedal feel, let me just, 
yeah, it's all right, it's okay. You can adjust the regen as well, um, so you can go uh, through three levels and have an adaptive level. So again, and there's a one pedal drive mode, so all that can be altered through here, through the screen. Talking of uh, drive modes, there are a few of those which we access. Well, as I said earlier, you can access it through the screen or you can tag it in as one of your favourites. So if you can, there's a snow mode, which obviously just dials back on all the torque and allows you to give a lot more deliberate use of the throttle. Uh, I'm just going to dial back the speed on this road while I'm talking to you. Um, so you can you can have a much more prodigious use of the throttle. Um, you go into eco mode when everything just gets dulled off and it switches things off to eco out um, the range to its maximum. There's normal, which I've been, was been using 99% of the time. Um, and as I say, you know, coming up the motorway the other day, up the M6 in normal mode. And as I say, it feels just like an MG4. And I say that's no bad thing. And then, of course, your last one, well, sorry, you've then moved to sport, which is where you can do your ridiculous takeoff and things. And then there's a custom mode, so you can tailor it how you want it. So you can change the steering feel, you can change the throttle uh, feel, you can change the motor power. So, you know, you can set it up how you like, and that's all done through there. And as I say, you program it into this button. And I do like that. I like the fact you can access it from the steering wheel. That's good. Driving position, um, the way the car feels to drive in terms of where you're sitting, all the controls around you, standard MG4. The only thing I will say is there's an odd resonance that comes from this car. There's a really odd bit of road noise and I'm not sure. I, I, I think it's a resonance from the tyres and the wheel arches. I'm not 100% sure. The tyre pressures are fine. And it's just odd, it, it, there's a, like a little th kind of thrum you get from it and you can feel it through the steering wheel. So it's definitely coming from the wheels. And as I say, just on a, even on a smooth, smooth road on the motorway uh, coming up to Moffat this morning, even though it was billiard table smooth on that surface, there's this, this little kind of tiny, tiny, tiny vibration that you tend to get through the steering wheel and you can just hear the kind of thrum from underneath the car. And I think it's a resonance. From the wheels so it's not quite as refined as the standard mg4 either which is a bit odd it's running bridgestone turana turanza tires i think they're called um maybe it wouldn't have been my first choice of tire for the car but there we go so summary fast yes unquestionably absolutely fun not so much it's okay um, as I say, it's not a bad car. I don't want to give that impression. It's very good, and as I say, it's given a lot of smiles to me in terms of, you know, this acceleration that it's capable of. But when the road starts to get a bit twisty and the surface gets a little bit undulating, it's kind of, it's not really answering the questions that I'm asking of it. And that's a bit of a shame. I did really think there was going to be a bit more to this car than just straight line speed. Now, whilst MG are trying to sort of like alleviate themselves and move themselves away from being just seen as a budget brand, there's no denying the fact that this is an incredible piece of value for money. I mean, the MG4 range still starts at under £27,000 for the SE model. This car, however, I think offers the best value for money in the range in some respects if you're talking about performance cars, because this car is just over £36,000. The only option that you can have is the paint finish, and this is the most expensive paint finish, and this puts this car up at £37,295 as tested. Now that's £7,000 less than the ID3 Pro that I tested a couple of weeks back. That's an incredible piece of value for money. And remember, of course, you're still getting MG's seven-year warranty with that. But as I say, for the same price as the x -Power, you now get the Trophy Extended Range, which does over 300 miles. And it's no slouch, because it has 260 brake horsepower and does not to 60 in 6.1 seconds. And it's the same price as that. Hmm. Now, competition. Now, this is an interesting one, I think, because it will depend a little bit on how you view the car. 
as to where you see the competition for it. So if you're viewing it as a five-door family hatchback, a C-Sect hatchback at this price, then obviously Volkswagen ID3, Coupe Reborn, uh, Citroen EC4, uh, or a funky cat, as I say, that's another one. Uh, and of course, the new cars that are coming along from Stellantis Group, so the uh, Astra Electric, and of course, the Peugeot E308. However, if you view it as a hot hatch, at this price level, then you've got to view things like the new Abarth 500e. Now, I know it doesn't have the range, the performance of this car, but it has the fun, as does the Mini. And the Mini is about to get the new Mini Electric, and that's going to get an uplift in power as well. But there's two cars that I think that they're a little bit left field here, but bear with me on this, that I think you need to consider as competition for this car. The first one is the Smart Hashtag One Brabus, because that's going to be just over £40,000, and that's offering over 400 horsepower with the same performance as this car in a five-door practical family car. And of course, if you're looking at the Smart Hashtag One, then of course you've also got to look at its sister car that's coming along, which is the new Volvo EX30. So, yes, they are small crossovers, but they've got the four Ps with them. You've got the price, you've got the performance, you've got the power, and you've got the practicality of the MG. So I'd consider them as well if I were you. So here's what we like and what we don't like about the new MG4 X Power. We like, well, we like its styling. It's searing straight line speed. It's well equipped as standard. It's relatively comfortable. The warranty package and the value for money it offers. We don't like. Well, we feel whilst we like the styling, there should be a little bit more of a hot hatch element to it. Some areas of the interior still lag behind class best in terms of the quality of plastics used. The chassis is lacking that final fun factor for us. And of course, you have to sacrifice some range for that performance. So, Another trip to Scotland, another trip up the beef tub with another performance orientated electric car. What are we to make of the MG4 X Power? Well, there's no denying that it's going to be difficult to go faster for less in the EV world than it is with something like the MG4 X Power. And it is a good car because it's based on a good car, the MG4, and I really like the MG4. I think it's a great car. So, and the X Power is a little bit like the Tesla Model 3 when it came out. It offers huge performance for the price of a, a normal sort of like everyday style of car. But I'm not sure it's the best MG4 you can buy, if I'm honest with you. You see, the, see going into sort of like that performance hot hatch market is all very well and good. And it's great delivering that sort of like 400 odd horsepower and that supercar baiting sort of like acceleration. But it's just lacking that fun factor that I want out of a hot hatchback. And if that's where MG was trying to go with the X Power, they've kind of missed the mark, I think. It is a good car, as I say, but I think you're better off putting the same money into something like the Trophy, extended range, and sacrificing the performance and getting the range, the bigger range that that car does offer. So it's looking like it's down to the Cyberster to restore MG's reputation as the makers of sports cars because as the maker of hot hatches, this just misses the mark by that much. Thank you for watching another episode of OTV. Thank you for joining me back in Scotland again. Thank you for putting up with a very, very busy bank holiday weekend on the beef tub. It's a lot busier than I expected it to be, so there's a lot of traffic going past. So thanks for putting up with that. Um, as always, please make sure you are subscribed to the Auto EV channel. And then once you've done that, make sure you then press the little bell button that's down below because then that way you'll be notified when our next video is uploaded and goes live. Once you've, if you've enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Motorbike, thank you. Oh, two. And um, as I say, don't forget, make sure you leave us your comments down below. Let me know what your thoughts are on the cars that we've viewed. And of course, on the channel as a whole, do you agree with me? Or do you think I'm absolutely blethering, as they say up here in Scotland? Would you pay the money for the Expert, or would you sacrifice the performance and go for the bigger range of the extended range one? As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Now, as always, we're across all social media platforms as well. So Facebook, X, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn. So please give us a follow there, because every little bit helps the channel. And as always, please remember, if you're dying to know more about electric cars, you want to see even more reviews, then just stay on the channel, because we've got absolutely 
loads of videos out there, not just road test reviews, but electric icons, twin tests, used car buying advice, motorbikes and electric vans as well. So there's enough there to keep you going, I would suggest. All that remains for me to say is thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to support Auto EV. I hope you've enjoyed the scenery again at the top of the beef tub. I'll see you again soon.